and I will begin making a brief comment. Uh, we've been talking about implementation uh, in terms of pharmacogenomics. Uh, I just want to mention that for the last couple of years, the NIH Clinical Center has been offering uh, HLA genotyping uh, when uh, abacavir, carbamazepine, uh, and now phenytoin, and allopurinol are prescribed by practitioners in the NIH uh, Clinical Center. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Barry Goldspiel, who is acting, uh, uh, rather, Deputy Director of Pharmacy, uh, co-chairs the Pharmacogenomics Subcommittee with me. And Dr. Bill Flegel in the Department of Transfusion Medicine is in charge of the actual HLA genotyping uh, implementation. So I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, the clinical center is, in fact, uh, moving in that direction. It is required for abacavir. Uh, otherwise, it is a recommendation, and clinicians uh, may uh, decide on an individual patient basis whether or not to order uh, a test at, at any given time. So uh, with that, uh, again, this is open for general discussion. If I could just make a make a comment, building a bit on, on what Steve described, um, it seems as though, Steve, you have a system that, you know, you've got data collection forms, you've got the software. You know, it, it shouldn't be all that difficult to, to transport that to other systems. And so um, recognizing that Cerner is, is not the, the most penetrant uh, nationwide, but still it's it's one that's that's fairly standard. So, so, you know, recognizing that that's not your mandate to do, how could we facilitate that happening if that would be a useful thing to happen in, in other systems? Well, I, I, I think we would be um, um, perfectly willing to, um, to, to share the, um, the forms. I mean, the institution paid for the development of the, uh, the system through a contract with, with Cerner, so it's, it's the institutions. And, uh, I mean, the, the whole goal was to come up with a system that would allow, if there were to be a cutaneous adverse drug reaction network, um, I mean, I was only thinking in the context of pediatrics because that's really what our focus is, but if there were ever funding for a, um, a, a network, we wanted to be able to participate in the network um, by having everything in place. And uh, we would be more than willing to share um, you know, whatever, whatever we can that, that, that would uh, facilitate this uh, occurring at more institutions um, w uh, wherever. So, so what does it take? I guess it takes um, uh, probably a medical IT person at, uh, at a given hospital or system to, to tweak it or engineering. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, but it was our medical um, um, informatics uh, team working with um, uh, the Cerner em employees who walk around with Children's Mercy Hospital ID badges on to make it happen, and, th and that's the extent of my knowledge. Yeah, yeah Mark Williams Geisinger, unfortunately, uh, living in this uh, world. So, uh, you know, these things are conceptually simple, but um, uh, actually uh, realizing them is incredibly difficult because what usually happens is that these do get built as one offs, and so they will work in Cerner, but they won't transport necessarily even to other Cerners. And so I think. The strategy would be to um, take advantage of, I think, what is a little bit of a momentum uh, that's gathering uh, as a result of the GM7 meeting and the IOM uh, EHR Action Collaborative meeting, uh, where people are saying we really have to solve this generalizability issue and we have to use some of the standards that are available that are going to be uh, uh, all certified EHRs are going to have, like uh, um, uh, fast health uh, healthcare interoperable resources and those sorts of things. So I think that um, as we develop uh, a strategy, assuming that we want to move this forward, that this is, uh, you know, creating a network, creating standardized data uh, entry and those sorts of things, uh, engaging with the informatics community to build the resource such that it would be uh, at least in theory interoperable with any uh, certified electronic health record, um, uh, not integrated within it, but sitting on top of it and able to communicate with it, uh, would be uh, a desirable approach. But it's it's difficult to do that without 
um, so, sort of a, a national perspective because the at the individual level it just doesn't move in a generalized way. So it, it's it's very challenging. Although although as we've as we've talked about, it's a big country, and and trying I think to to do this on a national level, I mean eventually it could happen, um, and and yet you'd, you'd like to take advantage of sort of willing partners early on, and and if there were you know at least a handful of of hospitals that wanted to to partner, and then those could grow and those could grow broader. And maybe Josh, you, you wanted to comment on, on that? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking that, you know, I think it is great to have these interoperable standards and I think we need to continue to shoot for them. And, you know, certain, there have been some great demonstration projects like SMART and things like that that could run across which of these apps that you can put across different uh, uh, SMART enabled uh, EHRs. But, you know, optimally to be effective, it's got to be integrated within the EHR. Um, in, a, in a way that sort of fits all the standard workflows people are used to. And I, I do think as long as you, you, know, you have standard outputs um, and, and think about what those outputs look like, then the work you've done in Cerner to design a form that, that works well and the data elements you want to collect could be probably mapped to something that looks similar in Epic. I know we could probably do something similar, for instance, in, in our EHR. Um, and, uh, of course, ours is homegrown, so we have the ability to sort of do what you know, kind of whatever we want. But the, um, uh, but uh, I think that those elements, if you standardize the outputs, you could cross them across different systems. And I, Mark is completely right that, you know, what works in one Cerner doesn't necessarily work in another Cerner. Same with Epic, et cetera. But it gives you a great head start. It's a lot easier to adapt code that's in one Cerner to another Cerner application. So I would think the model is a, a good step forward. I mean, the, the thing that I would, uh, I completely agree with what Josh has said, but I think what you really want to do is you want to have a, a, an eye on ultimately where you want to be so that you don't create, you can create something that works with a small number of partners, but if you create it in such a way that it only works with that small number of partners and doesn't have a vision for uh, extensibility, that's not a good outcome either. It's a lot of resources that ultimately won't get you where you want to go. So I think it, you know, starting with a smaller group across multiple uh, EHR systems and demonstrating that it can work will then lower the energy barrier to um, extend it more broadly if that's the direction that uh, things want to go. And we had talked yesterday at our breakout, and we'll hear about this, about whether or not you know, even something within uh, groups that are participating in the Sentinel uh, program could potentially uh, utilize something like this, um, uh, which again would have a lot more uh, uh, oomph behind it if we could pull something like that off. Well, and, and maybe if I could just make one one quick comment in, in response to that, it, you know, what what we seem to be talking about is is not at least doesn't sound like research, and so so you know for NIH this would be a kind of a tall mountain to climb. On the other hand, you, you made the very good point that then it provides the infrastructure on which you can do research. So, so then we'd be interested. So, um, so is, it, is it possible to sort of leverage this with the variety of patient safety um, initiatives that are ongoing? And, and I'll turn to our FDA friends to, to help us to, to know who the people are to engage. I would think AHRQ to some degree, um, that our Agency for Health care, research, and quality, um, and, and potentially the CDC, uh, but, but I, I don't know. So I don't know, Mark or others, if you want to comment. So I don't have a very specific answer, but there are a lot of stakeholders in the government who are interested in this. And actually, the Deputy Secretary of Health had recently convened a report, which I sat on as a steering committee member, to look at various aspects around three areas of safety events and how to leverage informatic systems and so on to uh, to improve the both the research aspect but also the patient management aspect and they brought in some IT specialists um, AHRQ was one of the groups that was involved all right across the whole government actually so we can find out who are the people to go to but I think that the vision here is to have a system in place informatic system in place which you can use both for patient management, so that is early recognition of events and interventions, uh, the research aspect, and then the public health aspect. So those are sort of the three-cornered hat. And if, you're, and if you really do it right o over time, you build the network so that it becomes basically for these rare events especially 
um, you know, sort of, all, you know, encompasses hopefully the whole healthcare system or as much as possible. The other aspect, and Dr. Hoofnagel is going to talk about this, is that besides the data elements which are important to accumulate, you really do need a clinical brain to look at individual cases. You need this kind of causality analysis, which also has its own methodology so that when, when patients are being seen at the bedside by the clinicians, they're actually calling what those, what those cases actually are. And there needs to be a system in place where, in addition to the data elements, there's a kind of smart narrative which has, a, which has its own consistency across the system where their narrative synthesizes what the patient actually had and what the expert brain thought the, what the diagnosis was. So, and that FDA has a lot of experience with this as an issue, is how not only to get information bits, but to actually get the differential diagnosis, the causality analysis, the phenotype, and so on. So you still need that as part of the, the collection and documentation, and this will be especially important for genomics, where when you start doing whatever your case control study designs are, you won't have confidence that the cases that you accrue to do genomic analyses on are that are bona fide cases, that they're not something else, because otherwise you won't have a good research platform. I just want to say the other group to talk to would be ONC. Other questions or comments? Yeah. No, a comment. Uh, the one problem is we can come too diffuse and get all ADRs, when this meeting is focused on a very serious one um, that does call for research, you know, type of investment. One thing about these, um, these forms that we're very involved with is they can be used to calculate causality scores, um, severity scores, to put these things in context, including you can include a, uh, what we call a completeness score, which basically you have enough data to, to decide, are the cases too confusing to, to consider? Because when you take all ADRs, a lot of them aren't as clear cut as the ones that get presented at these meetings. They're, they're a mess. The patients, we have patients who are taking 25 drugs. So not much you can do with that. So these types of scores can be built into these systems and you can give an, uh, an output to the person who puts it in. It can even include a recommendation like do HLA typing or something like that. But we have been unsuccessful in getting people to actually submit things to us through these types of uh, computerized systems. Uh, that does raise a question. What what um, a challenge for us is is uh, polypharmacy, and you know, uh, on average, patients are leaving the hospital with eight different medications. So um, it really makes the um, cause you know the association very complicated. And I think there's some areas here for research and how to approach that uh, difficult problem. So maybe to change the, the uh, topic a bit, um, Cynthia, you, you commented, uh, or when you, when you presented, um, that educating your clinicians was a key part of, of the effectiveness of your uh, initiative, um, and, and that the way you did that was through a letter to them, um, pre and post. And, and I, I just can't imagine that our physicians would pay attention to a single letter. So, so there was that's, probably no, more than that. That's, yes, that's, that's right. I mean, it was really that the director of medical services said, this is now standard of care. That's what made the difference. We had, in 2009, we came out with a newsletter which summarized what was going on in the research, um, uh, validating, you know, uh, reporting the 1502. And there was no change at all in the carbamazepine uh, SJS. So it was really convincing um, at the Ministry of Health level and telling people this is now your, your uh, basically like your clinical practice guideline. And I think we've been feeling more and more that it's really getting these kind of recommendations into clinical practice guidelines that all is really the way to go. No, they don't listen to, they don't read drug labels. And in terms of, of clinical practice guidelines, we, we're fortunate, I think, to have the, the clinical 
Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC, that is, is developing guidelines, but they're not a professional society. And so what you'd like is a professional society to say, you know, this is, this is our standard of care. And we heard yesterday how one of the challenges with carbamazepine is that there are multiple specialties that, that prescribe it, so you don't have a single specialty. But is there some way to, to unify those or approach the, at least the major ones? I mean, I, I think you identified, you know, several that are, are likely to be prescribing this, and then maybe kind of target them that way. Well, um, yes, one, one of the HSA uh, staff, you know, presented at the Singapore Epilepsy Society. So, like, for even here today, there's no neurologist, right, in this meeting. So, I, uh, unless I'm wrong. I mean, yeah, well, we no, and not around the table. We do have, have neurology colleagues from our, our Neurology Institute. Uh, oh, right okay. Here. Yeah, but I think we need to reach out to the, uh, the disciplines which are actually prescribing the drugs, um, so that's where they'll influence the uh, decision whether or not to do the test. So Taiwan, one of the, uh, one of the um, initial interventions that helped was actually targeting off-label use of carbamazepine. Um, is off-label use um, a problem in Singapore? Because I guess that also speaks to the issue of the cohesiveness of the providers you'd be speaking ter to in terms of how to prescribe carbamazepine and the constituency groups that would be involved. Uh, yeah, I, 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 not familiar enough. I do know it's used by dentists uh, a fair amount, but um, you know, for for tried, but I think that's in the label, right? Uh, the, not neuralgia. Yeah. So, um, in as far as inappropriate uses came up yesterday um, with uh, allopurinol, that a lot of the cases we see are um, just being used for um, asymptomatic hyperuricemia, and that is not in the indication. But um, uric acid is standardly measured in these health screens, and then when it's just a little bit bumped, they, people start um, getting taking. Uh, uh, allopurinol, and I think if we eliminated that population, we could get, uh, even without genotyping, we could get some uh, impact on the uh, cases. So I have just one comment, uh, Mr. Leader. I, I liked your presentation a lot. And think one challenge is definitely getting as many patients into these the documentation systems, but another is harmonizing the system so that we're using all the same and guaranteeing the quality of the data and your comment on rash which is for dermatologists really a problem uh, and 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 getting that sorted out and your comment on phenotyping good phenotyping is really something that i think is important because those like munir or others who are doing genotyping experiments afterwards i mean if they want cleaner clear results they have to be sure that the phenotypes are correct in this system and, and that's a challenge i should just mention that the, the, dr french has joined us for our second day we very much appreciate your coming from from geneva so welcome so uh, maybe two or three random thoughts in terms of um support can you step closer oh forward? sorry in terms of uh, support for these kinds of projects uh, national registries and work thereof um, remember PCORI, the uh, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. This could be uh, a really interesting project uh, for them. Um, and then thinking about patient-centered uh, kinds of programs, I think yesterday, you know, uh, was mentioned the idea of social media and uh, engaging uh, patients uh, through programs like Patients Like Me and other social media programs. Uh, you've already heard how important uh, this is to actual patients and patients' families and um, um, homegrown uh, grassroots registries uh, could be potentially much more powerful than uh, top-down uh, approaches as much as we think we know about about this, this problem. Um, the last comment, uh, a little bit different from the first two, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about um, over the course of the last day, you know, what's the offending drug? There's polypharmacy, and chart reviews that take hours and hours to try to figure all of this out. But um, And then I've also heard, uh, I think Terry mentioned yesterday, that maybe there's this common pathway that we should be thinking much, much more about. And um, with, again, sequencing of HLA, which, um, again, is possible and will become better and better, maybe we don't need to worry so much about what the offending agent is. We should be thinking about HLA essentially uh, as the main uh, offender 
genetically. And uh, as many of you know, there are various kinds of statistical tests, burden tests, uh, aggregate tests that uh, might be very useful in essentially determining overall what is the role of uh, uh, fine variation in HLA with regard to um, Stephen Johnson syndrome, really irrespective of the offending agent. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you have another? Yes, uh, this is just in response to Terry's questions about guidelines. One clarification and, and then a comment. The CPIC guidelines uh, presume that you have the genomic information in hand and provide guidelines about what to do with the information. They don't actually provide guidelines about who to test and who not to test. And so that is of some relevance in a situation where we're really talking about should we test or not test. Uh, the second thing is, again, in my role as wet blanket over the last two days, uh, I would just once again point out that at least in the United States, there's been a fair amount of scholarship that shows that creating a clinical guideline does not in fact rapidly change practice, unfortunately. Some of it is because the guidelines are frequently constructed in such a way that they're not adequately explicit. They would say things like should consider or make, you know, what we uh, refer to in the informatics world as weasel words. Um, and so it really gives clinicians a lot of uh, latitude. Um, but again, the, ro the role that guidelines can play is that you can then use those to um, uh, develop clinical decision support that can really uh, work well. And the last point I would just make is one more lever to push, button to push, particularly related to severe adverse drug events, uh, is the liability uh, point, uh, with, and particularly in the United States, although it sounds like this is an issue in other countries as well. Um, the hospital leaders don't like to hear about the fact that, hey, we're exposing ourselves to liability because we're not doing something to prevent these sorts of things. And so if you're like me, or you use any tool in the toolbox to get what you want, uh, you know, you, this is just another weapon to add. So. Thank you. I just want to add that uh, uh, professional guidelines is really important, I think, because uh, when, when you, I mean, the American Society of Professional, like uh, American Society of Rheumatology, when they update the cow treatment guideline to suggest uh, HLA B5801 testing in Asians or in Thai, it was published and then you have a PDF downloadable all over the world and our clinician read it. So when I talk with the head of the rheumatologist in, in Thailand, they, they concern about that recommendation because uh, it was published in your guideline. Yes, so, and also the FDA recommendation here is also used in the other part of the world. So if you have a recommendation update in the FDA or the professional guideline, I think it's, it has a world, worldwide effect. But I, yeah, but I, I would say that um, we, we, we struggle this because like for abacavir, it's almost absent. 5701 is almost absent. So it's not cost effective at all in, in Asia. So, the, the, you know, just, just follow, you know, just follow what is coming out of the U.S. is not always the, the right thing. And we're struggling with allopurinol because of the limited alternative medications. Uh, if you are 5801, there really aren't a lot of other choices. So I think we're thinking more along the lines of increased uh, safety monitoring rather than changing the drug. So I, I am a, a little bit curious, though, in terms of the, the 5701 that is not at all prevalent in, in Singapore. Do you have a back of your hypersensitivity? Uh, very little, but we also have very little HIV. Um, oh, okay, yes. Because so, yeah. Uh, yeah, for anyone who's coming to the country to work, you have to take an HIV test, and uh, yeah. and you don't get your entry pass if you're positive. <laughs> but but we have a, a Bakuya testing in Thailand, and it's it's a standard recommendation, and partly it's because uh, I mean the international guideline recommend to test is before use the Bakuya. So we will uh, conclude then this general discussion. And as Terry uh, mentioned earlier, there will be a group uh, picture group. taken, yes. a group photograph. And thank so, you very much. And we're, everyone. so before you go, thank you very much, Juan. Uh, and bef before we go to, to break, then we're supposed to gather in that back corner there. Um, and the, the quick, more quickly we can do that, and, and uh, effectively, the easier we can get on to break. So please, please do that. Thanks.